The Jelly Cars series is defined by its cartoony, squishy wow, physics. Wow. In this video, we will reveal the truth that behind these complicated looking physics is nothing more than a bunch of dots, lines, and springs. This is the physics of Jelly Car. This video will not be a tutorial. We're not going to look at code and I'm not going to describe each algorithm in exhausting step-by-step -step detail. But what I am going to do is try to explain every element involved to make a soft body physics system like Jelly Car as clearly and visually as possible. And one of the first things to realize is that you're not simulating a car, a tire, a block. You're simulating all the points that make it up. These are known as point masses. A point mass is just what it sounds like. It's a single point in space with a mass. It also has a velocity and forces can act upon it which will affect its velocity which will affect its position. But it has no collision of its own. So if you start with this, you can make a simulation that looks like this. You have a bunch of points and an example of force like gravity can act upon them and they'll move. The next thing we need to do is group them into shapes. And the shape is actually just a list of points. So to define a shape, you say I have these points in this order. And if you connect the points in that order with the line segment, you create a shape. Great, so we can make different shapes now by connecting our point masses which allows us to move on to one of the most important steps, which is collision detection. Now remember, for our soft body system, we're dealing with points and shapes. So our method goes something like this. When checking if two objects are overlapping or not, what we do is we start with object A, and we test all the points on object A to see if any of those points are inside object B. And we also do the opposite. We test all the points on object B to see if any of those points are inside object A. We'll get into how we resolve the collision in a second, but you might be looking at this and thinking, wait, I don't think that handles every case. And you're right, we could have a case like this, where these two objects are clearly overlapping, but if you look closely, no point in either object is actually inside the other object. And in Jelly Car, the truth is, we simply don't handle this case. You can see an example of this right here, where if the car is moving really fast and hits a thin object, half of the car can get pushed to the right and the other half can get pushed to the left. So none of the points of the car are technically inside that object anymore and the physics system is happy. The good news is this is pretty rare because being a physics simulation, things move step by step, which means usually before that worst case happens, there's a moment in time where the points of one object are inside the other, like right here. And if we resolve the collision there before we get to this case, we should be fine. This is a good example where when making a physics simulation for a game, you don't necessarily have to continue making the physics system perfect and handle every possible case in the world. If most of the cases required for your gameplay are handled, it's enough. Okay, so as I said, what we do is we check each point on object A, see if it's inside object B, check each point on object B, and see if it's inside object A. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, if you have a closed polygon like this, and I should mention it has to be a non-self-intersecting one, so it can't look like this, it needs to look like this. But if you have a nice one like this, which is the case for most of our gameplay, you can detect if a point is inside by first uh, taking your point you want to test, then finding another point that you know is outside the shape. Connect them with a line and count the number of intersections with the shape as you walk from the point you're testing to the point outside. If the number is even, like this, you must have started outside the shape. If the number of intersections is odd, like this simple example here, then you started inside the shape. Here's just one more quick example. This one has one, two, three, four, five intersections. So yep, that's odd. We started inside the shape. So I said you need a point that you know is outside the shape for this algorithm. How do we find that point? Well, we use the bounding box. Every object already has a bounding box. And so when we want to test a point, we can take that point and just move that point to the right until we're just a little bit outside of the object's bounding box. This guarantees that point is outside the shape and also means that our test is always going to be a horizontal line. And knowing it's a horizontal line actually allows us to make some optimizations to the algorithm that counts the intersections as well. Okay, so now we know a point on object A is in fact inside object B. How do we get it out? Well, the first thing we do is we find the closest point on object B to wherever this point we're testing is. And that point will give us actually a direction and which edge of the shape is the closest edge. And based on this information, we now have three points involved. We have the red point and then the two points constituting the edge. And we're going to move all three of them just enough to resolve the collision. 
and how much we move these points is based on their relative masses. So heavy ones move less, light ones move more, and also based on where along this line segment we are. So here when I'm towards the left edge, the left point on the edge will get moved more. And now if I go over to the right side, then the rightermost point on this edge will move more. Okay, so that method handles the problem of getting the point outside of the object that it found itself inside in the first place. But because it's inside the other object, it means these two objects have actually collided. And when there's a collision, we also need to update the velocities of the points involved. Here in blue, you can see some example velocities. So the red point is moving up and to the right, and this line segment, we're both moving sort of left and down. Now we have three points here, which is awkward. So we're actually gonna collapse the two points that constitute the edge and act as though they're one virtual point. We average their velocities. Now we have what looks like two circles colliding. So we look up the math for what happens when two perfect circles collide, and we can work out what the new velocity should be after this collision. Once we have those new velocities, well, the red point's all set to go, but this yellow point is like a virtual point. It actually represented the line segment. So we're gonna redistribute those velocities back to the two points involved. And now we've actually handled the whole process. We've resolved the overlap and updated the velocities. Okay, we're making really great progress here. We now have point masses that can move. We can collect them into shapes and we can even detect and resolve collisions, which allows our car to turn into mush. Which brings us to springs. Springs are one of the main methods we're gonna to use to try and have objects actually keep their shape. And a spring is really nothing more than a force that wants to keep two objects at a certain distance apart. So you have this rest distance, the distance these two point masses would like to be. And if you squish them together, or pull them apart, a force is created that acts on both points to try and pull or push them back to their rest distance. And you have a lot of control over this, of course, because you decide what is the rest distance and how strong is the spring. So now that we've got that, we can take our shape and go all the way around the edge and replace all these edge lines with springs. And not only that, we can pretend we're a little bridge builder here and we can connect internal springs in sort of a cool triangulation pattern like this to give it some structure. And now with this step, we actually finally have something that looks like a soft body simulation. In fact, at this point, you might convince yourself, we're done here, look at this. We can make all sorts of shapes, we can put internal springs inside them, they hold their shape, they bounce around. Here we go, let's go make a video game, right? And for the most part, that's true. We can really make some pretty detailed scenes here just with uh, simple springs. There are a few scenarios though that happen fairly frequently that are a little difficult to overcome. Let's look at this example here. Keep your eyes on the bridge object. And you can see right there, something happened and one point on the bridge object sort of popped over to the opposite side and it's now uh, a self-intersecting shape, which as we mentioned, our collision detection does not like and is very likely to freak out and explode. And even if we survive the explosion, look at this. The object has settled in a configuration where it sort of flips in on itself twice. You can see what's happened here is that the springs are sort of relatively happy and have reached a stable configuration where they popped inside out in a few places. So this is clearly something we want to prevent. So let's talk about ways of trying to maintain shape. In Jelly Car's physics system, I have a few options. The first one is pressure. This simulates a virtual amount of gas inside the object, inflating it like a balloon. And by calculating the volume of the object and the amount of gas you think is inside it, you can produce a pressure force that pushes outward on the edges of the object relative to the amount of gas inside. This is actually how the tires work and also things like balloons work in the engine. However, a pressure force is not a great solution for something with a unique shape like the car shape because as you fill it with virtual gas, it's just gonna balloon out into a circular shape and kind of fight the springs inside that are trying to keep it shaped like the car. So I have another method I use for things like this that I call shape matching. And this is definitely not based on reality, um, but is a technique that uh, gets the job done and is good enough for a video game. So the basic concept looks like this. You have the shape you authored for a car. So we sort of set that off on the side. Um, and then when the object is moving around in the world and for example, it gets squished like this, we say, what about that original shape? What if we pretended it was a rigid frame made out of metal and we placed it right on top of where the car should be if it wasn't deformed right now? 
and then we connect all the points of the car with their corresponding points on the frame with a spring. And that spring will try to pull those points back to the original shape. And this won't pop inside out like the bridge before because the points on the top of the car will always be pulled towards the top of the frame and the bottom towards the bottom of the frame. Okay, so for this technique to work, we need to know where to place this frame so we can apply these spring forces, which is actually not uh, obvious because we don't actually have a position and an angle for this car, right? We just have the position of all its individual points. So imagine it's like right here. How can we work out the position and angle for the frame? Well, the position is not too bad. We take all the points and just average their position. That essentially gives us like the geometric center. So now we can center our frame around that point. But what about the angle? Well, what we can do is walk around and for each point on the shape, compare the angle between that point and that same point on the unrotated frame. And they're all gonna be a little different because it's deformed, but if we average them, we get an average angle that pretty well represents the angle of the object at that point in time. And that's what we do. So we're constantly using these steps to work out where to put this virtual frame that allows us to have a good uh, basis for our shape matching forces. You do have to be careful though. Um, this car example is about twice as wide as it is tall. And when you squish it vertically, all the springs get stretched kind of an equal-ish amount, and so the forces are kind of in balance. Uh, but when you squish it the other way like this, you get a few points that are really far away from their frame, and so you get these mismatch in the strength of the forces. And so the behavior can get more and more unrealistic as the objects gets wider. Uh, one solution to this is to have wide objects broken up and have multiple smaller frames that just work on a portion, like you can see in this example here. One happy accident of all this is that I realized if I just skip the step of trying to figure out where to place and how to rotate the frame and just placed and rotated the frame manually, I could move it around and get animated objects. This is actually how the moving platforms in Jelly Car work. We just animate the frame for the shape matching and the springs pull the object along to match. And this means that interactions with these moving objects are still somewhat physically realistic because a heavy object can kind of push it and the springs will struggle to keep it in its position. And even things like collisions still work because we're just using spring forces to move this object around because um, we're animating the frame, not the object itself. Okay, at this point we're getting really close to being able to make the gameplay of Jelly Car. We've got points connected into shapes and structured with springs. And then we have techniques like gas pressure and shape matching to help them maintain their shape. We even have moving platforms. We are missing one key element though. We don't have any way to connect the tires to the car. For that, we're going to need joints. And in the Jelly Car physics system, I have a few different types of joints I can use to connect things. The most obvious and simple one is what I call a weld, which is basically saying take two point masses and make sure they're always in the exact same position, kind of like they're stuck together. So you can connect objects together this way. But what about the car? You can see the tires here are attached to the body, but there isn't a point mass at the location we want to attach them. So instead what we do is we pick a few points on the tire and we average those points to get an anchor. Then we do the same thing on the body. And actually we do a weighted average. So this way we can adjust the weights to decide where exactly this anchor should end up. So maybe we pick these points and weight them like this and we find an anchor like that. And then we do the same thing for the back tire but we choose different points of course with different weights to get the back axle right there. And now we have anchors relative to the car body and to the tires where we want those two objects to be perfectly lined up with an axle. And now during the simulation, if for example, a tire drifts a little bit away from the car body, what you do is you take all these points involved, the points on the tire and the points on the car, and you move those points until the anchors line up again. And that's how you can make an axle wherever you need it. Another thing that's like a joint is a distance constraint, which is basically a rule that says, I'm stronger than a spring and I will make sure that two points are never more than some maximum distance apart. And I use that for things like ropes. Ropes also need collision, and since ropes are thin, they don't really work with the shape-based collision, so I added a concept of particles, where a point mass could be marked as a particle, and that individual point mass would then have a radius that can collide and resolve with the other shape-based objects in the system. And so that's how, for example, uh, distance constraints and particles come together to make the grapple rope power up. 
There are a few other features that I have in the engine. One is shape changing. You can see here the staircase that turns into a ramp. And this is actually similar to the moving objects thing where I realized I could just animate the shape of the shape matching frame and get objects to change their shape in real time. Another one is triggers. So you make a shape, but instead of having it have physics, you just have it detect if other objects are inside. So for example, this little cloud here that gets triggered when you go enter a zone. Uh, also camera triggers are a good example. So when you go into a certain region here, I switch to a static camera to better frame the action. And then when you leave that trigger, we go back to the normal game camera. Or an example here, where we have a trigger zone for a framing camera that always zooms out just enough to keep both the car and the stop sign in view. I also use triggers for things like gravity zones. So here you can see a few different shaped triggers. They're all set up to provide different gravity. So when you drive in the section of the level, when the car gets inside those triggers, the gravity direction changes and you can make interesting platforming challenges like these. And finally, I have a ray cast so I can cast a ray into the world and see what it collides with. I use this for things like tripwires and also how to detect where to attach the grapple rope, for example. And that's pretty much it. Those are all the major elements required to make a soft body physics simulation like the one I use in Jelly Car Worlds. I love making physics based games. I think they're a great example of systemic design, where a game has a lot of simple systems that all combine in interesting and unique ways. Because the entire movement system is based on physics alone, players are often able to do things that I couldn't even predict. And that makes the game rich and interesting and deep. Okay, thank you so much. If you made it this far, you might as well subscribe to the channel in the hopes that I make another long video like this. And please leave a comment if you're interested or inspired to make any kind of physics simulation of your own. And if you'd like to support me, please check out Jelly Car Worlds. Information on the game is in the description. Thank you so much, and bye!